when I was a boy, uh, I, was, I was raised in a God-fearing home. Uh, so my parents, uh, one of the things certainly that they did right was to teach me a belief in God and to trust in his son, Jesus Christ. My dad had a dependency on alcohol and uh, really came to the point where he admitted that, that he was an alcoholic at, at one point in time. As a young boy, the, the challenge of, of dealing with my dad's heavy drinking uh, and my mom's uh, reluctance to, to deal with that in, in, in a way that uh, didn't place more of a burden on me, um, I think is, is one of the major things that contributed uh, to my eventual slipping and uh, into the homosexual lifestyle. My dad was, was always more outspoken when he'd been drinking and uh, not, not tactfully so. Um, I can remember having guests in our home and uh, my dad not, not, not treating them with courtesy or, or the respect that maybe that they deserved because, I mean, my dad was bringing, bringing me up to, to respect and, and show courtesy towards people. And so when, when guests would come into our home uh, and, and my dad would, would speak to them or about them. Uh, there was, there was times when, when his drinking was such that, uh, he said things that shouldn't have been said, uh, and things that caused the rest of the family to be embarrassed, uh, about the air or the environment that that created. It caused me personally to have, uh, a misunderstanding of, of love itself, I think was, was one of the keys. Um, love to me and interaction with my dad, um, was sort of a competition, I think, uh, with me and my sister, my dad, uh, I, even as a young boy, I, I noticed that there, w there was a difference in the way my dad would interact with me versus my sister. Um, I felt like I was always challenged to, to meet his demands and his expectations of me. And as far as love goes, I thought, I thought the two were tied together very closely. I thought that, uh, that if I wasn't meeting what, what I perceived to be his expectations, if I wasn't, uh, behaving so that I wasn't being disciplined for something, then my reaction as a boy was that, well, love has decreased at this point. Um, during discipline, there was, there was never any reinforcement of, I still love you, son. Um, it, it was often done as in anger, as I, re, as I recall. And, uh, it was even harder for my sister, um, just to relate to my dad and, uh, to interact with him. And, uh, that's where the competition side of it came in. I, I've, I've had people ask me, you know, well, your sister seemed to have it even harder than you did. So why, why then, uh, do you bring this up? And it, to me, I, I was aware even as a boy that somehow I was maybe favored by my dad. Uh, even though the environment itself was difficult, I was, I knew I was favored. And, uh, so there was always that, that sense of this competition going on. And if I do something to slip into second place, then maybe my dad's going to love my sister more than he loves me at this point. And, uh, just, just a lot of confusion and, and, a, a lot of misunderstanding for a child uh, age nine to, to process. Being loved uh, equated to living up to dad's expectations of me. It, when, when I felt like I was doing a good job meeting my dad's expectations, or what I felt like he demanded of me, what I felt like he wanted me to be and, and act like as a person, uh, then I was loved. And if I wasn't meeting my dad's expectations, um, then discipline came in and sometimes it was done in anger. Uh, and without the, the reinforcement that I still love you and I'm, I'm disciplining you for this, uh, I took the anger as I'm, I'm less value to my dad right now, uh, because I haven't met his expectations and therefore I'm loved less. It was, 
it was a system where you you sort of lived from failure to failure and you accumulate these you know in the mind of a of of my childhood these you accumulate the love and you build it back up and then when you get to the next failure it just sort of wipes everything away and uh, you got to start all over again was the perception that I had. I remember when I started as a child examining or uh, processing trying to figure out who my dad was toward me and 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 what I wanted to become as an adult um, several things I I observed the relationship that, that some of my childhood friends had with their dads. And I remember noticing that there was more interaction between my, my friends and their dads. And it brought up the question in my heart, you know, why? Why, uh, why is it so easy for my friend to interact with his dad like that and, and to joke and play around? And, uh, and it seems like that there's, there's this wall or this void between me and my dad, it's, it's, I noticed that it wasn't the same. As I grew older, I think my mom came to depend on me more. And uh, I, I became in a way her emotional outlet. Uh, when she would grow frustrated at my dad, she would she would communicate this to me as I got older. She would, she would begin communicating this to me. And so I, I began to sense uh, that I was, I was sort of an emotional crutch for my mom during all this. Um, I don't remember that that necessarily uh, distorted my view of, of women in general. Uh, I can remember when I was in, uh, when I was in middle school, I can remember being attracted to other females. Uh, I can remember, uh, you know, showing showing interest in dating, and uh, but at the same time, uh, just just feeling like I was I was different than all the other guys. It, it seemed to seem to come so natural to them, and uh, it 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 just seemed awkward, incredibly awkward for me. I can remember that. Uh, my dad's treatment of my mom when, when he was in an intoxicated state, uh, that he would also treat her badly by my perception. Uh, there was never any, any physical abuse, but certainly a lot of emotional abuse. And uh, I think that caused me to, to draw into my mother more as well. Uh, I think we began to depend on, on one another in those situations. Uh, me seeing the way that, that my dad was treating her, uh, her leaning on, on me, uh, out of, I guess, really, uh, ironically, out of respect for my dad, um, not wanting to, to communicate the alcoholism outside of the family, outside of the four walls of our home, uh, just sort of keep it in the family, so to speak. Um, I, th I think really it caused a situation where we started to draw from one another. The first childhood experience I had with uh, what would become homosexuality and homosexual behavior, uh, I remember it vividly. I was only nine years old. Uh, I was spending the night at a friend's house. And uh, he, he encouraged me to, uh, to do some things with him that... Uh, that I probably knew with my upbringing, uh, that I probably knew better than to do. But uh, this particular friend that, uh, that I was staying over at his house, uh, I remember being very infatuated with him. Um, I remember the awkwardness that it took for me to make friends and to interact with, with the other boys in my class. And so, this awkwardness of just male bonding and male interaction, uh, I, I sensed it. I didn't know how to describe it at that age, of course, but uh, I, just, I just sensed an awkward need uh, that I wanted that male bonding, that male interaction. And uh, so when this, this kid showed up new to our school, he was instantly popular with the other boys in the class. And so 
I was elated when, when he warmed up to me in friendship. Uh, I was willing, because it was so difficult for me to make friendships, I was willing to go to great lengths to maintain those friendships. And so when he suggested this activity that, that may, it, you may be able to look, look back on it and, and see how it occurs in different childhood friendships and say it's normal childhood curiosity. Uh, but it also changed me in, in a way that, uh, you know, robbed me of my innocence, my sexual innocence at that point. Um, it, and it made me curious. It, it, it stirred and awakened curiosity in me that, uh, that never went away. It, uh, I thought this was what friendship was. This is what friendship was supposed to be about between that point at nine years old where that first incident occurred with that, uh, that childhood friend and the point at 19 years old when I actually accepted Jesus Christ into my heart as my savior, there were, there were numerous other incidents that had occurred uh, between myself and other friends. Uh, it was all mutual, but uh, it was also all damaging as far as my understanding of friendship, my understanding of love, uh, my understanding of, of what male interaction was, was supposed to be about. Uh, and uh, so I was, I was pretty sexually confused at that point. I was uh, pretty emotionally confused at that point. Once I went into the military, I had a, I had a platoon sergeant. I had the fortune of, good fortune of having a platoon sergeant that uh, was an ordained minister. And he encouraged me to keep on reading my Bible. He's the first one that talked to me and mentioned the word salvation to me. And I was also, this was the early 80s, and I was reading a popular book at the time by Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. And Mr. Lindsey, at the end of that book, takes you through what has essentially become known as the Romans Road. And he takes you through scriptures out of the Book of Romans and gives you the opportunity at the end of the book to receive Christ. And that's, that's really how it, how it happened for me. I got to the end of that book and I knew that I had found my answer as far as connecting with God, as far as how does one go to heaven? How does one do things right? How does one live their life for God? I, I knew I had all those answers at that point and I went into the to the back room of the MP station and I got down on my knees with no one else present and I gave my life to Christ at 19 years old. I later came to understand the sexual side and what I had sexualized in, in, in the voids that I felt inside. Uh, going back to the relationship and the things that were lost between in, me and my dad because of his alcoholism, uh, I was able to see later on that there were legitimate needs and legitimate longings that I had that, that I had sexualized and, and that I turned into homosexual behavior. And I was, it wasn't for years after becoming a Christian that I was able to start seeing the difference between those two things. One mistake I think I made was, was dealing with all of this all by myself. Uh, dealing with all of this, afraid to reach out for help either from a pastor or, or through uh, a Christian therapist or psychologist of some sort. Um, I did get one of Joe Dallas's books and uh, really, really turned around my thinking it was one of the things that drastically changed my, my thinking about what I, was, what I was dealing with as a human being as far as the homosexuality went. And I actually was able to get a hold of uh, Joe Dallas on the telephone one afternoon. And uh, that's, that's one of the first times I remember reaching out to anybody was when I called him on the phone and he was, he was willing to answer some of my questions and uh, get me headed in the right direction and really just help me to feel better about myself and realize you know, you're not the only one dealing with this. Healing comes in understanding why that I'm feeling this way in the first place. What, 
what sort of things from my background, from my relationship with my dad, uh, was it that I'm missing and that I'm craving and, and that I've sexualized and, and, and sought out in non-legitimate ways. Homosexuality is, is dealt with, with, with the normal. You, you interject yourself into normal forms of affection between men, into godly forms of affection between men, into godly interaction between men. And especially in this area of affection, once I understood that affection between men was okay and that there's a godly level of it and that there's a line you don't cross and just that normal, if I can use that word, uh, interaction between men, it, that in and of itself has decreased the desires for the unnatural and for the, the sinful behavior of homosexuality. It's, it's made it even in my own spirit and in my own struggle with the things uh, that I remember struggling with, it's, it's, it's caused it to become more of a disdain, the behavior itself. I, the behavior itself, I, I can remember once craving things that the Bible says is sinful. And now in my spirit, when I think about those things, they're, they're unnatural to me and they're, they're awkward to me. The healing came through natural affections and interactions more than, more than dealing with the homosexuality, homosexuality itself. And most especially, as far as Christianity goes, when you, when you uh, consider that side of it, in, and my story would be, be incomplete without Jesus Christ involved in it. But uh, as far as Christianity goes, when I became a good Christian, at least in what I perceived in my mind was a good Christian, I found out very quickly that trying to be heterosexual as part of my Christianity didn't work at all. All it did was, was suppress feelings and desires that, that were still there. And uh, I wasn't dealing with the real issue. And it's, it's, there's an old cliche that says putting the cart before the horse. Well, in Christianity, it's the same thing. I found that when I was seeking after heterosexuality instead of seeking after Jesus Christ, I was getting nowhere. When I started to seek after Jesus Christ and learn his character, learn his personhood, and learn who he was and, and the way he so genuinely and, and unconditionally loved me, I found that I wanted to be more like him, that I wanted to be more like that in my own life. When I started pursuing that instead of pursuing heterosexuality, the changes started coming and occurring naturally. I'm so thankful to God the Father for his patience with me. I, uh, through all my distorted emotions and perceptions of, of, of how he was supposed to love me and how I was supposed to be acting as as an adopted Christian son into this thing that we call Christianity. He's always been true to his promise. He's, he's never left me or forsaken me. And uh, he has certainly fulfilled the role of father and, and, and really daddy in, in my life uh, in a way that nobody else could have, in a, in a way that nobody else could have had the patience to do. Uh, He's, he's completely uh, healed, healed the father wound itself that I experienced growing up as a boy. Uh, love, is no longer, love is no longer a competition with me and God. One of the things I've come to understand is that God loves me unconditionally. God loves me, Dean Bailey, and that there's nothing at all that I can ever do or, or some way I could fall short that could ever change that. He, he has proven that to me time and again, and uh, he proved it to us all 2,000 years ago by giving his one and only son. But I just, I didn't get it. Um, and when it, when it became real to me, uh, it's, it's when I started uh, being able to push all these misperceptions aside of what, what God's love was and that it was very different than the example that my own dad had given to me. 
homosexuality itself, I would not, I, I, and I've seen no evidence that indicates that homosexuality is, is genetic in nature. Uh, the science just isn't there. I, I've looked and uh, I've looked also in, in Christianity itself when I was, when I was struggling with it and, and feeling like I wasn't getting anywhere. Uh, I looked for scriptures and, and took them out of their context that, that would allow me to believe that homosexuality was even biblically condoned. What homosexuality is, is environmental. It's, it's not the, I don't believe it's, it, it can ever be the same for any, any two people because we're all unique, uniquely created individuals and we all, the circumstances that we encounter growing up are all vastly different from individual to individual. And even, even if two people encountered the exact same set of circumstances, they're still two different people and the way they react to them is gonna be different from one individual to the next. And so homosexuality is, is a thing of the human soul. It's, it's a deception that, that is fostered by environment that, uh, that affects the soul, it, it, it affects the spirit, but it's, it's never who we are, who God created us to be. Homosexuality is, is how we try to cope. And we're guilty of putting it on, on a special pedestal, I think, in, in, in dealing with it like it's, it's something different than any other sin. And it's certainly not. Homosexuality is a behavior and, and just like so many other sins are. It's, it's a human means of coping with all the hurt and all the, the difficulty that we as human beings face in this world that we live in. You do not have to live your life as a homosexual. Granted, I think it's probably one of the most difficult things there is to overcome because it feels like so much a part of who you are and this world is presenting it that way, especially in American culture. Uh, it, it, it's being presented as an identity rather than a behavior to be dealt with. But I think truth casts all that aside and uh, certainly, no, you, you do not have to live your life as a, as a homosexual. And though you can make that personal choice to, it's certainly not God's best for you. God has a higher calling and he's not trying to take something away from you. He's, he's trying to give you all that he has to give for you, all, all that he wants and, and, and has prepared for you. And, and homosexuality is, has never been part of that plan.